You know, this is the beginning of the level of, pre of the presence of God that we need. I want to see his presence get so strong here that every bondage breaks, that every wounded heart is made whole, that every broken body is healed. You know, this week I've been thinking a lot about Moses and thinking a lot about myself, believe it or not, because I see Moses spent 40 years as the prince of Egypt. Then he spent another 40 years as a shepherd on the backside of the desert before God said, go set my people free. Could you imagine that task at 80 years of age? What made Moses such a candidate for it was that he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. If God didn't do it, it wasn't going to get done. And when I see the task before us, and I see the task before what we need in Marshfield, and I see the task with what we need to happen in America, no man can raise up and do it. We got a lot of young whippersnappers trying to jump up and get it done, and they can't do it because it cannot be done with all the technology that we have today. It can't be done with all the mood lighting that we have in churches today. It can't be done with eloquent words. It's got to be done with the fire of God. It's got to be done with the power of God. Yesterday, I hit 53 like a car hitting a wall. Because I think God gave me one of the greatest gifts that uh, he could have ever given me yesterday, and that was brokenness. I realize that what's before us, I can't do. Can't do it. I can't get deep enough in theological concepts to get it done. I can't be as eloquent as I need to be to get it done. That if God doesn't do it, it's not going to get done. I've looked back at my life and Mary, I come home yesterday saying, what have I really done? What have I really done? 50, 53 years, what have I really accomplished for the kingdom of God? What, what, have I, what have I really done? And it was like God saying, now that I've got you there, i got something to work with. And I really think that we, we all need to be there because we, I believe the fire of God will only come when we are at the end of our own strength and totally dependent upon him. This morning, I want to ask you, what kind of believer are you? What type of believer are you? And I think in America today and in the world today, especially in the Western world, there's only going to be two types of believers, only two. The thing I've got to ask you, and I want to go to Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Give you a chance to find it this morning. And it came to pass in process. I want you to underline that word process in your Bible because we're in process right now. God, why is it taking so long? Well, you're in the process of time. We're in a process. God's trying to get us from where we are to where we need to be. Don't resent the process. We're going to be in a process for some time here at Biblical Life because God's needing to move us from where the devil moved us and put us to where the kingdom needs us to be. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Now notice it says it there twice. That's not just to sound poetic. It is God emphasizing that their bondage caused them to cry. That that's the imperative here 
that until we wake up and realize where we really are and the bondage that we're in, we're never going to cry out. And until we cry out, heaven's never going to move. And God heard their groanings, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and he had respect unto them. Guys, all we have to do is to be honest with ourselves to realize that there is a reason for us to cry out. Every one of us. Your affluence can't cover up the bondage. You can have the best whatever phone and the best whatever gadgets and the best whatever house and the best whatever car that can anticipate your every need and even wipe your nose as you're running, driving down the road so that you don't have to be distracted and you still be in bondage. America has been a nation that has been enslaved. You know, all you have to do is rename chains entitlement and people will put them on quickly. Guys, every one of us are in bondage here. There is something that we need to be free of if we're honest with ourselves. Now, a religious spirit will tell you, I don't need to be free. But I think if we're wanting to have the fire of God fall, we just got to be real. Guys, something has taken our joy. Something's taken our shout. Something has taken our spiritual vision. Something is siphoning off our health and our strength, and something has slowly stolen our hunger for the presence of God. All of us here today are in need of a breakthrough, a healing, a deliverance, and a miracle. Every Christian in this city is in the same place. Every Christian in this state is in the same place. Every Christian in this nation is in the same place. Every Christian in North America is in this same place. It's the same whether you abide in the United States of America or Canada or Mexico or Europe or Africa. The difference, I think, is for us in North America is our affluence has masked our need for deliverance. The fire of God will come and only come because of our cry. It won't come because you hold a revival meeting. I think a lot of what we have called revival meetings are just kind of getting hopped up in the flesh. And we have a lot of things being called revival fire. Guys, revival fire is not going to cause you to laugh. Revival fire is not going to cause you to, to do a lot of things. What it's going to cause you to do is fall on your face before God and say, I need free. I need free. The second thing I need to ask you, you're, you're either realize, okay, I need to be free. Or can I ask you, are you a Christian that has learned to turn a blind eye to your bondage? Let's go to John chapter 8, starting with verse 31. And this is really where I think most of America is. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, Thou shalt be made free? And Jesus answered them, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, I look back historically. Was Judah a free nation? 
they were under the heel of Rome. And yet here we have guys telling us we have never been in bondage to anybody. Oh, yeah, speak out against the emperor. See how fast, how, what that gets you. Speak out against Washington. See what that'll get you in this day and this hour. That'll put you on a blacklist. Their blacklists sometimes have drones following them. I mean, guys, we're, 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 we're in a, a, a spooky time. I shared with you a couple weeks ago how that state troopers in Colorado came and said, we're being told that evangelical Christians are one of the greatest threats to our nation. That's also been told to the U.S. military, that the U.S. military in a recent briefing were told that evangelical Christians are the greatest threat to national security above the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda above the KKK, above this group and that group, that it's really evangelical Christians. The military has now passed a new regulation that forbids chaplains or members of the military to evangelize in the military. Still trying to dig up whether it's an Article 15 offense or a court-martial offense. Now, I know enough about American history to know that evangelical Christians are the backbone of the U.S. military. Come on now. As someone who has served in the military. But we also have a nation that on May Day, now if you you understand Soviet Russia, communist Russia, May Day, the 1st of May is when they have their great parades that they march down, uh, march down Moscow with, with all their tanks and all their missiles and all their troops. That's the, that's the grand parade day for Russia. And we had a senator hold a rally on May 1st, and there were communist flags flying at the rally in America. Mary and I were talking this morning, you know, that would, if that would happen a couple of decades ago, he'd be on trial right now for treason, and his life would be in danger by the federal government. And the truth of the matter is, listen to me, believer, that if this is a socialistic nation, a communist nation, evangelical Christianity is the greatest threat to their national security. Because if we would cry out, They're done for. Come on now. There has been many a regime in history that has tried to destroy this book, that has tried to wipe out the body of Christ, that are now no more than dust in a history book. But I think one of the things that's going on in our nation is that we are so enamored by what the Pharaoh has provided on the outside. He knows that if it, they, they start putting us in concentration camps, if they, if they start beating us and making us go do hard labor, that we'll begin crying out. So it's not the Pharaoh within that's the, pro- oh, out, that's the problem. It's the Pharaoh within. The Pharisees had the Pharaoh within that kept them in such bondage that they thought they were free. How many know this is not the land of the free anymore? There are over 2 million regulations to make sure that you are not free. We have Christians gripe about the 613 laws of Torah, and we have over 2 million laws on the books, and they're writing them just as fast as they can. I've seen this week... Where all the Democrats that used to say Obamacare was the greatest thing and was the answer to everything are now saying that it's going to be a train wreck. Leading Democrats, not side Democrats, that it's going to make premiums double, triple, and quadruple, and yet we're going to be required by federal law to purchase it. And that it's a train wreck. It's going to destroy the economy. The very ones who hailed it and brought it in.
How many know we're in trouble? We are in trouble. But all the external things, it's not your biggest problem. It's the internal ones. It's the Pharaoh within. That's why we've got to take a hard look in the mirror and say, without him, I'm nothing. Without him, I'm nothing. Now, most of us can point to some external things that that cause problems. But I really believe that probably about 75% of everything that we're going through is internal. Internal conflict. Internal unhappiness. Wrong concepts. Reacting to things wrong. How you respond, I have found, makes all the difference in the world, not only to those around you, but to yourself. Because I think sometimes we make things worse by the way that we respond in life. We need to realize that everything this world has to offer is not going to make you happy. It's not going to make you happy. Nothing. We always say, if I can just get this, I'll be happy. No. I remember there was a time in life, you know, you get the new fancy doodle wop, whatever it is, and it's, <gasps> oh, and it lasted about a week. Now it's about a day, isn't it? An hour. About as long as it takes to get it up out of the package. Doesn't do it. All of mankind, guys, knows that we're looking for something, that we need something, that we're all messed up. And those that have taken God out of the equation are forced to begin to worship and follow after the man that's coming the man of sin. They're primed and ready. Whether it's some teen that can sing and all the people go, ah, do you see his moves? Give him 30 years. He won't have those moves no more. Okay. Some politician and they go to these conventions and there's almost worship involved our kids some of our kids in some of the more liberal schools are almost taught president worship there was a time guys there was a nation called rome that they worshiped their king in my recent visit to canada kevin pulled out some of the history of Japan, and some of the, you know, a lot of the history, you know, did you know that during the days of the samurai, there were Christians in Japan? And, the, and the, they, there was the long march, they would be corralled up and bound up, and they would be marched to a place where the emperor gave them grace to, to repent and to renounce Jesus. And the whole time, knowing that when they got to that end of the journey, that the samurai were going to cut their heads off because they refused to worship the emperor. They refused to worship a man. And the whole time that they walked that, they said, we are not worthy to die for your name. We are not worthy to give up our lives for our king. And as they would do this long march, other believers would come out of the crowd that had not been corralled by the government and begin to walk with them and say, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. There's something within a pagan heart that it wants to worship a man instead of the God who created man. And guys, we're approaching that ever so quickly. And it's the turmoil within government programs. I don't know about you guys, 
But I'm realizing that every step the government takes to solve a problem, they create nine. If they would just back off and leave well enough alone. You know, I'm all for keeping the guns out of the hands of the criminals, but there's no law in the book that will ever do that. This week, our administration pointed to Chicago as the reason why we need stronger gun laws. Chicago has the strongest gun laws in the entire nation. And the, and the stronger the laws, the worse the chaos. Because, now, this, this, this is really profound, guys. Criminals don't pay any attention to the law. I know that's hard to comprehend, but only law-abiding citizens obey the law. The only way, in my estimation, to get the bad guns off the street is say, if you're a crook and you use a gun, you're going away forever. If you rob a bank and you use a gun... You better graduate to toasters because if you use a gun, you will never see the light of day again. If you hold up somebody and you use a gun, you will never, ever, ever see the light of day again. But the way things are right now, did you know the fourth largest equipped army in the world resides in America? But they're not U.S. military. They're gangs. They are the best trained, because many of them are ex-military. That They actually sent military in since 9-11 to be trained. Many of them are special forces. Now they're coming in and training gang with military tactics. They have the best weapons. We are now having our police force outgunned by gangs. We pull out a 9 millimeter and they pull out an AK-47. Who's outgunned? Come on now. How many know we need the fire of God in America? They try buyback guns in California. So I'm thinking guys are going to, you know, hand in their 9 millimeters to Smith & Weston. Guy brought in a rocket launcher. A real one. Guys, you don't buy that at Walmart. A U.S. military rocket launcher. Just maybe they don't pay attention to the laws. And the black market just laughs, says, go ahead. The harder you make for regular people to get guns, we're going to sell more to crooks, and eventually even the honest citizen will have to come to us to protect themselves. See, everything they do is making it worse. Man cannot solve his problems. This week I was... Looking at Walmart. You say, well, Mike, why you always talk about Walmart? There ain't anywhere else to shop in Marshfield, hardly. <laughs> Walmart price cutter. Maybe wander through Radio Shack every once in a while, but I mean, that's a three-second journey. You walk in, hit the back wall, walk out, you know. Just watching the people. Their eyes are dead. They're full of sadness. They're full, full of hopelessness. You see, it's not just about us crying out for us. We need to start crying out for them. If we don't have the fire of God in us and God doesn't deliver us, how is he ever going to deliver them? Guys, it's getting bad. It's so like the other day, this fellow went by and he, he saw this guy's bumper sticker. It said, honk if you love Jesus. So he honked as he went by. And as he went by, the guy was telling him he was number one because he honked. How many of you know that's a Christian in bondage? You actually do what the bumper sticker says and you get a rude awakening as you drive by. How many know that's a believer in bondage? People are pushed to the very limit. We're in a time in society right now in America that we, that the, the veneer of civility 
is growing thinner and thinner by the day. We're one millimeter away from anarchy. Road rage. Now there's shopping rage. There's, there's mall rage. There's coffee rage. There's everything that you can, there, there's a rage just waiting to happen on the, People are so dissatisfied with themselves, they're forever scarring and marring themselves because they can't even stand to see who's in the mirror anymore. How I many know your earlobes aren't supposed to be this big? Scarring ourselves and tattooing ourselves. And we have Christians that don't know who they are, so they run after the world and, and they let the world tell them how they're going to dress, uh, if they're going to have tattoos, whatever it takes to be cool. And we're, we're so desperate for an identity because we've lost who we are that we're letting the world define it. And we don't know it, but the, the world has turned us around to where we're like a pig being led by a ring in its nose. We're not supposed to be followers except of Christ, but in the world we're supposed to be leaders. We're supposed to lead them to God. But the American church, we have PA systems, we have computers, we have cameras, we have the internet, we have all these things. Do you know what we are? We all hold membership in the first church of Laodicea. All of us. That's our dispensation. Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. This is really what heaven is saying to us this morning. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, knowest thou not that thou art wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked? Do you know you can connect that to the Lord returning as a thief in the night? Not the rapture movies but back into the historical and cultural context of that idiom. That the priest was required in the midnight hour to keep the fire burning, the fire of God burning on the altar of God. And when he would fall asleep on the job, the result was that the high priest would set his clothes on fire with some of the alt, some of the, the, the things from the altar, the coals from the altar, and he'd have to strip and he'd run naked through Jerusalem to try to get home, and everybody would see his nakedness. That's connected to this. We think that we are, that we are, are prosperous, we have everything that we need, but we have fallen asleep on duty. We have fallen asleep in the midnight hour. We have fallen asleep, and the fire of God has almost gone out on the altar of God, and and Jesus has revealed our nakedness so that we can run back to him. There was, I, I think this is a picture. As the guy runs off the temple mount, he turns back around and runs back to the high priest and says, I messed up, please clothe me. I repent of what I've done. I realize that I'm naked and I'm poor and I'm wretched and I'm blind and I come and let me buy from you gold tried in the fire. The book of Malachi says that the Messiah will come quickly into his temple and he will be a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. You can't be refined without the fire of God. And what I, what I have found in my own life, there's only two ways. How many know it's like pruning? Jesus said, you know, I prune those that, uh, that prepare fruit so they can bear more fruit. And those that don't bear fruit, I just Prune it all the way down to the nubbins. <laughs> so you're pruned if you do and pruned if you don't. You're going to have fire, either the fire of God because we have humbled ourselves before a holy God saying, I need you, or you can go through the fire of tribulation and persecution. One way or another, God says, my people are going to be holy as I am holy. That we're going to have to go through some refinement and we can do it willfully, or God will let the world do it. Because the only way to cover our nakedness is we've got to buy gold refined in the fire. Might I place before you 
Better to have the fire of God than the fire of persecution. Persecution is coming. When the federal government has targeted you, I don't see Christians blowing up places. I have never seen a Christian wear a suicide vest. All I've ever seen him do is carry a Bible and tell people that Jesus loves them. But now our own federal government says that we are the greatest threat to national security. Have you seen how hard they have hunted down Al-Qaeda? If God doesn't change things, behold your future. We don't bring down buildings, we just bring down sin. Come on. God is saying, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, which represents holiness. Recently, we had a very popular preacher get on television that's hyper grace and said, you know, this uh, without spot and wrinkle isn't really what that means. It just means something else. Holiness. Holiness. Dressed in white raiment. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. We need to, I think one of our greatest cries right now is, God, let me let me see my need. Open my eyes and let me see my need for you. I can't cover it re with religion. I can't cover it with apathy. I can't cover it with the past. I can't cover it with anything. Let me see my need for you. I think only until then. Can we actually keep our eyes on the ball? Because when it comes to the world, this is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. They're blind. They're blind. And if we can't see, how are we going to help them? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Guys, we're literally in a day. Isaiah 50, 20, 21 says, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. That's not the world today. That's the church today. That's us. I've already shared about the military. I've shared about the senator. Our children are being taught that individual salvation can only be possible with a collective salvation. And we're being disempowered with the concept of entitlement. It does not empower an individual. It was what, what we call entitlement, even welfare, had an origin. And it wasn't in helping the needy. It was originally designed to pacify the First Nations people so that we could take their land and keep them from raising up and fighting us. It was the pacification of the American Indian. Rome did it another way. Rome got so, so powerful and so wealthy that an average citizen only had to work about 200 days, maybe 125 to 100, 200 days a year. That's all he had to do to maintain a very luxurious lifestyle. And so he has about 200 days a year that they can gather and start griping about the government and griping about this and griping about that. That was the reason for the Colosseums. 
It actually wasn't originally to, to get rid of Christians. This, this predates Christians. It was to entertain the people because of their affluence. They didn't have to worry every day about having enough money every day. But idle people start finally looking up, not having their nose to the grindstone, and when they really start seeing what's going on, they start saying, hey, I'm noticing some things. And to, so to stop them from doing that, they start having gladiators fighting. That was all free. Funded by the government. Come and see what's on the public airwaves. Now instead of coliseums, it's become portable. You, you, have, you have flat screen coliseums that all over your house. You can now have them with an iPad. You can watch them on your computer. You can pull out your iPhone and be entertained or amused. I encourage you tonight to pull out your Webster's Dictionary and look out the original definition of amused or amuse. It means sleight of hand. I distract you over here while I'm doing something over here. The body of Christ has been amused to the place to where we're almost cold and don't even know it. We feel the power during the latest action movie, but don't feel it at church. Our favorite soap opera will make us cry and, and we just get so caught up with that life that we forget the coldness and the barrenness and the, and the futility of our own. We need to start having tears flow for our own lives with what's going on. Isaiah 55 and 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And God's drawing near right now so that we can call upon him. This morning as I sat in, in my study putting this together, God visited me there. And he said, you remember the story of blind Bartimaeus? Oh, yes, Lord, I have theologically analyzed that so many times. I've exegeted the Greek. God says, you don't know squat. In my heart, I could see blind Bartimaeus, and he began to hear that Jesus was there. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Isn't that the way we kind of read it? All the people, are, shh, shh, don't trouble the master. And then I heard the most blood-curdling cry of desperation come out of that man. No! Son of David! And at that moment, he began to take off his outer clothes that were the markings of a blind man. He began to scream almost like a woman in travail. I will not be denied. Don't hush me up. I've got to get to Jesus. He's the only one that can change it. And God said in the midst of that, he said, there is where my church needs to be. We've got to learn to cry out to God. That's the season we're in now. It's not even getting to the fire. It's getting to the place to cry out. When we start crying out, the fire will begin to speak. Come on, guys. If we can't do it for us, Let's do it for all those with dead eyes on the outside because right now the cold church as a whole isn't doing anything. And I'm not seeing lives change. In this city, there's prostitution. In this city, there's drugs. In this city, there's child prostitution in this city every diabolical thing that you could think of is going on in this town 
in this little city. And you can take that and multiply it many times over for Springfield, where we have the headquarters of a Baptist church and a Pentecostal church. That with many times within a stone's throw of the steeple's shadow, there are children being molested and sold. If we can't cry out for us, let's cry out for those that don't even know there's a God. It's time that we learn to cry out before God. We need him so badly. Not just, and I'm not just talking about around the altars during church. Every day we need to cry out before God. It needs to be a part of our devotion to God to cry out. To cry out while driving to work. To cry out while getting ready to go shopping. To cry out in the morning when we get up. To cry out when we're getting ready to go to bed at night. It needs to become a lifestyle until the fire falls. Until we get that, we can't go any further. Guys, I have about exceeded my last sermon, I feel like. What good is it for me to get into the depths of the Word of God here when there's so many people dying out there? You see, I want your lives turned around, but I want more than that now. The devil's pushed me to a place where I want this city. God, I want it. I want it to be a place where kids are safe. Where kids feel safe. I remember going to school when you were a kid. There was always the bullies and those who made fun of you and everything else. Yet we have kids today that think that's the safest place on earth. Because they have no safety in their homes. They have no safety in the streets. I want that to change. I want the mom and dads that are hooked on crack or meth that are right now selling their children for another fix. I want them set free by the power of God to see them restored, to see their children restored. I want to see people start having church up at Walmart when they get together and start talking about the things of God instead of being so miserable that they can't even hardly take another breath as they get the cans off the shelves. Guys, we need it. We need it. We need it. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we begin to cry out by reason of the bondage. Father, we cry out this morning to you because of what's going on in our own lives. Father, we need you. Father, there's so many places in our lives that we're to the breaking point. Father, we can't take any more. We can't take any more. No matter where we turn, all there is is bad news. All there is is something else that we've got to deal with. Father, we cry out that we need relief. Father, we need for you to set us free. Father, we need for you to come and to break the chains within and without. Father, we need for you to come and to heal us within and without. Father, free us from the past so that we might live in the future that you have for us. Father, come touch our bodies and heal and restore so much the enemy has taken from us. Father, we ask this morning that heaven would come draw a line in the sand and say, not another inch, not another thing. And Father, become, become our deliverer, become our restorer. We cry out this morning, Hosanna, Lord, come save us. Father, save us from the lie that we don't need saving. Lord, we want to cancel our membership in the Laodicean church. 
and simply to become a part of the church of the living God whose fire and whose presence and whose word is holy and powerful. Oh. Father, come loose your healing. Father, we need miracles this morning. We need miracles this morning. We need miracles this morning. Father, loose creative miracles in our bodies. Father, we ask that you would heal parts that don't work anymore. Father, that you would replace ones that have been worn out and aren't even there anymore. Father, that your presence would decimate arthritis and cancers. Father, we're asking for creative miracles that there's even been things that the doctors had to remove out of our bodies because they no longer worked or they were diseased. But, Father, we need them. And, Father, we ask for you to replace them this morning. Father, restore us. And, Father, even more than the physical things, our faith has grown weary. Our vision has grown dim. Our hope is nothing more than a, a fleeting glance of anything anymore. We have surrendered to the tyranny of the familiar and have become used to the chains and used to the nothing ever working and used to not seeing your power and used to not having prayers answered. Father, I ask that you would find us where we are, Father. We believe, help our unbelief. Father, meet us where we are right now and by your grace, restore us to the place where we need to be. I just feel like there's things crumbling right now. There's things crumbling right now. Right now. Right now. There's some walls the enemy has built that separated you from your heart. They're crumbling right now. Between you and your hope, I command those things to crumble apart right now. Oh, Lord. Restore our vision. Restore our faith. Restore our strength this morning, Father. Restore our determination this morning. Father, come. We need you, Lord. We cry out upon you. Father, the word says that those that cry out upon the Lord shall not be ashamed, but they'll be delivered, they'll be saved. Jesus, come. Come, Lord, and deliver your people. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us, Lord. <sighs> Give back our joy. It's been taken captive. Give back our happiness. Give back our gladness. Give back it. Father, we ask that you would restore it all. That you would take our weariness, Lord, and that you'd give us your strength this morning. Father, let us set our hearts to you this morning. And Father, let us not look back. We have put our hand to the plow. And Father, let us keep tilling forward, breaking up the fallow ground until all is restored according to your design. And Father, I prophetically loose your destiny, your plan, your purpose over everyone here this morning. And Father, anyone who ever listens to this message, Father, I ask that you would eradicate the devil's vision for them. And Father, that you would wipe it out there that you would destroy it. And Father, that you would put within it your purpose, your vision, your power, your fire, Lord. Bring us to the place where we need to be in you for this day and for this hour. Oh, Father. 
We just receive it this morning. And Father, we're going to keep out crying. We're going to keep crying. We're going to keep crying out, Father. Father, because there, there comes a time when it gets to such a pitch that, Father, heaven's got to move. Because one of the things that we found in your word this morning is you respected the crying. You respected the crying out of your people. And it activated your covenant. Father, make it so in our lives this morning. Let us have a determination like blind Bartimaeus that we will keep crying out until Jesus calls us out and sets us free. And Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for it. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name.